Asia will account for nearly 50% of all new grocery retail sales between 2019 and 2024. That's according to the IGD. And the markets that matter most, Indonesia, China, Japan, and India. And uh, Shop Talk Live uh, this week uh, is in India. We're live from Mumbai. Um, we obviously would like to get on an airplane and, uh, and get over there. This is the next best thing. And um, before we get into the, uh, into the program, perhaps just like to flag up some of the other international things going on. Uh, just like to give a big thanks to the guest authors of our recent features covering other parts of the world. In addition to India, that's on the Middle East, Russia, and South Africa, as you, as you see there. Um, big thanks to those guest authors. Right, so today, joining us live from Mumbai, we'll shortly be welcome, uh, de welcoming Dipayan Baisha, who's the Head of Strategy and Communication at Future Group in India. Uh, Pradeep Chachani, who's a retail expert with the Highway Center and is a very much an uh, Indian retail market specialist, will also be joining us. And uh, not from Mumbai, Mumbai, but live from London, uh, Rimmel Patel, uh, online director at Tesco uh, in the, in, here in the UK, will also be joining us. Now, um, my good friend, uh, the co-host uh, with me today on, uh, on Shop Talk Live is, uh, is Scott Annan. And uh, Scott, you know the retail market in India very well, don't you? Yes, Dan. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, I've been privileged to have been there many times and uh, worked with both Dipayan and Pradeep. Very exciting. Now, it's 32 degrees in Mumbai, Scott. A um, little, bit, little bit colder where, where, where we are. Um, it, obviously, we'd like to be there, wouldn't we? But, um, but uh, I think you, I, I believe you're, you're going to be there quite soon yourself. Uh, I am. I am. Uh, all is well, Dan. In a couple of days, I will be enjoying the 32 degrees. Great, that sound it sounds good, isn't it? Well, well, let's um let's welcome our guests to the to the show, guys. If you'd like to all um join us now, we'd we'd love to see you. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, good everybody. Good welcome. Well, a very happy morning, Scott. To you. Thank you. So, as you saw from the intro, and we've had lots of discussions, obviously leading up to this, guys. Um. I think one of the big challenges going forward uh, for someone who's used to learning from the West uh, is to learn from the East. Um, now, um, what's your what's your view on that on that change, um, Rimmel? I mean, I know you spent a lot of time working in Thailand and Malaysia. I mean, what's your perspective on that transition, that that switch? Yeah, look, I mean, thanks, um, <clears throat> Dan. For me, when I first joined Tesco, there were lots of opportunity to work with multiple businesses, so, you know, particularly Thailand and Malaysia, but also our businesses in Japan and Korea. And it was eye-opening to see how many insights that we could take from the East and bring over to the West. So the three or four big ones that stand out for me was, you know, when you look at the markets out in Asia, the customer, you know, consumer access and willingness to um, pay for service and convenience. Uh, the second one was actually, when you think about customer shopping missions, um, how much more sophisticated those missions are. So, you know, in the in the West, over the last 12 months, COVID has forced us to think about all the missions in between the big shop and the small shop. But actually looking at markets it's like, you know, Thailand six, seven years ago, the amount of mini shopping missions that were going on, you know, micro eventing, depending on which part of the country you're in, you know, celebrating different festivals and you saw that in retail. So that's, again, a big one. Um, and then the third big observation for me is when we think about next generation retail, there's some really good examples of that without all the expensive tech that we sometimes see in the West. So, you know, two, two specific examples that are, you know, still um, blow me away. Number one is the, um, the, the Bawalas in Mumbai. So these are the guys, uh, the network of 5,000 people who work industrially to deliver lunch boxes, you know, 200,000 deliver, deliveries by lunchtime every day. Um, that's about the same number of orders Tesco delivers daily through grocery home shopping, so online in the UK. And without all the you know technology, data, complicated systems, this has been going for 130 years. You know they've got an accuracy rate of one failure in six million deliveries, and logistically, it's, it's mind-boggling that this 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 thing works. And then similarly in Japan, there's a service called Yamato, where I can go to a convenience store, deliver my suitcase, and it turns up you know somewhere else in Japan three or four hours later. And again, these services have been going for 10, 15 years, and I think we often describe how sophisticated our supply chains are in the West, but there's some real inspiration in the East. So I think for me, it's those three things are the eye-opening ones. 
but also there are some big similarities you know whether you're in the east or the west there's the problem of increasing congestion in our big cities um there's growing competition for labor as all these gig economies take off um as a customer i'm you know sport by choice where do i you know what are the drivers of loyalty those for me are common problems very good i mean lots to come back on on, on yeah, that sure. very very interesting points but but just you know and we'll do that through i think some of those are, are themes which we'll, we'll we'll discuss through the whole program but just thinking about um the uh, Dipayan and Pradeep and your perspective on of this learning from the east i mean you you're very much i mean i know you you believe very strongly that um a lot of the i guess the, the lessons are coming from the east for you for yourselves in india as well right sure i think what has happened in uh, china in southeast asia and in india is in the last the last two decades have seen an unprecedented growth in income out here and along with it uh, we also saw globally uh, the whole emergence of the consumer technology happening and so therefore the retail in india has developed uh, or in southeast asia or in china developed with the advantage of the huge change that is happening in the whole technology space altogether and therefore we could work with very little legacies which some uh, retailers in the west had they had already developed systems processes but whereas here we were all building up with a very clean slate so therefore many of the new trends today you get to see it coming in from china i mean a couple of years back two to three years back we were all raving about say the hama store or how alibaba does billions of dollars of sales on the singles day or how they've cracked omni channel uh, and at that point it seemed like alibaba is something you really can't stop them and they're going to dominate and decide every trend mm -hmm. and today you see smaller players like pindudo uh, doing some amazing stuff the whole emergence of social commerce with live streaming coming in short videos coming in you have the group buying phenomenon coming in and uh, people like pindodo today have almost 17 18 percent share in china so therefore if you have to look at what's going to change in these markets and what's happening in this market you can pick up very interesting cues of course not everything will come or get imported in our home markets exactly in the same way we will have to contextualize it but the early signs of what's the next thing going to be in retail, uh, the cues for that could of very often come from places like a China, places like a Southeast Asia, Korea, Japan, and these are today great learning markets. Uh, no, very, very, very good points. Um, and and Pradeep, you probably agree with a lot of that. I know this is very much your area, the technology area that uh, you've got a lot of a lot of experience in in India and also Middle East and other parts of the world as well. So. Uh, I think between the West and the East, uh, though the markets are different, but the retail principles are more or less similar. Uh, maybe East would have, uh, you know, uh, a vast number of cherry pickers and deal mongers, hence low margins. And therefore, uh, uh, you know, retailers out here are forced to lower the cost through technology. And we have the economies of scale to cover up for the same. So, uh, uh, you know, I think India is one of the front runner here and uh, we have had uh, experimented and successfully uh, delivered a few uh, breakthrough solutions. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, virtually see clothing or accessory without trying them on. Uh, uh, see hologram or a 3D version of a product online. Uh, you know, receive alerts from a store close to you. Uh, receive alerts of deals. Receive alerts for deals from products you are interested in. And and there are there are a number of uh, a number of things, uh, uh, you know, which which we are experimenting. And and from that perspective, I think that becomes one one uh, one big advantage that we from technology we have. Heard. Well, it, that that brings us on very nicely, Scott, doesn't it, to to the next theme? Maybe I can throw the ball now for a bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I actually had a this one to Depay, and first of all, we've we've talked a lot about retail changing within you know 100 kilometers in India, different faiths, different festivals. How how does Future Group? sort of link in the technology to ensure that you are, you know, really talking to and serving those groups correctly. Correct. So, so India is a very interesting market, that kind of diversity that you see in India, it's huge. Like every few hundred kilometers, everything is changing, right? Your food habits are changing. Uh, your buying patterns are changing. The languages you speak to are changing. Um, so initially we have a lot of a focus was on how can we go on building interesting models for every set of customers that we are catering, we cater to. 
um apart from the social diversity there is a huge amount of income diversity as well i mean you have a country where the top uh, maybe a percentage of the population owns just as much as say their counterparts in singapore or united states but then you have a vast uh, part of the country which is has a kind of an income profile of sub saharan africa uh and it's difficult dealing with this diversity of the customers but then with technology you see you can develop very interesting solutions today if you have develop you, uh, we retailers have this unique advantage that we get to know our customers really well if you are a food and grocery retailer you know what the highs and lows of each of the customers are you could even get into further detailing for example as a we, we often know for example as a customer diabetic what kind of skin type that the customer has the sheep often by dry skin or just you have a very oily skin you could get this kind of data as well uh, we often joke over here we will get to know where the mosquito problems are in bombay just looking at the data uh, out here what much of this data today allows you to do is to have one on one conversation with the customers we are moving towards a journey where you can use the data to your advantage apply the right tools uh, i won't use the big terms artificial intelligence and big data much of that is often snake oil but you can start leveraging that uh, these tools in effective manners in which you can build one on one conversations with customers you can customize um, offerings in physical spaces and more importantly on digital interfaces with the customer where you can actually cater to the exact customer cohort or the exact customer persona that you're dealing with and that is the kind of journey we we have been going towards is um, how can we rather than painting the whole country with this one single color how can we get down and deal with every single customer nuance in a different manner hmm. and how about you pradeep i mean you, thinking about um, how much retail in india has changed i mean um thinking about the the size the scale of modern retail in india it's it's quite a big market if obviously it's it's not 1.37 billion uh people is it but it's it's 130 million which is i guess equivalent to germany plus south korea in terms of population scale so it's a that's a big market uh yes that that's right uh, so india though the population is 1.3 billion plus Uh, modern retail still caters to roughly about 35% of the population which is urban yes the balance still reside in the rural india where where modern retail has sporadically made impact uh a uh, contribution from e-commerce has drastically fast tracked uh, you know uh, thanks to the pandemic uh, and and there have been deep insights uh, often real time like like the bayan said Uh, you know given an edge to online and uh, brick and mortar retailer and a more personalized customer tracking has become possible uh so so technology actually has uh, been uh, a backbone where uh, where uh, you know uh, uh, where where all the players have been able to have been able to uh, you know uh, uh, create a good traction with the customers and uh, uh, we have been uh, i mean just to name a few so customer behavior the decision tree of the customer clustering customers for offers customer life cycle life si- lifetime value uh, share of wallet uh, the the loyal customers analytics uh, this is just customer based on this there are a lot of merchandise uh, analytics which can come up uh, you know so, so the private label play the the kvi is the key value uh, indicators so 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 while while overall uh, pie of organized retail is increasing uh, but there is this uh, 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 this technology uh, piece which is actually helping uh, retailers to go deeper and deeper into the uh, you know existing uh, urban market well let's just take that uh, thinking about online and how it's obviously online's developed everywhere globally um because of the pandemic of course it was developing anyway but it's accelerated in every in every market i guess india is the same uk is the same isn't it scott but what are the differences i mean let's just sort of think about how that's happened differently in comparing the uk perhaps with, with with india i don't know who'd like to lead off on that one in terms of uh, the maybe scott you could make a few comments and and then we can we can go to to the, to the retail guests yeah i'll i'll chip in a couple of things dan and then i think 
the Bay and Rimmel have, have, have got some very good insights here. What, what I've noticed, the Bayan mentioned it, that you know, they don't have this massive technology legacy. So the, the ability to do uh, real omni-channel is, is certainly there. Uh, they have different basket sizes. Uh, they can do small baskets. They, they have dark stores, which I'm sure the Bayan will talk about. But you know what? What I noticed in that market is that they they are ahead of what we do in many many things, um, and that is partly to do with technology, but a, a lot to do with actually customer demand and, and population density. But uh, maybe we jump into Depayan and then then Rimmel can uh, chip in there, Dan. Absolutely. Depay, and maybe you could comment on, on how it's different. So uh, in India, what you see is there are interesting developments happening almost every day in the whole online and uh, the omni space, so to speak. Uh, you know, uh, We had the first wave of e-commerce, which was just having a website or an app on which the customer would buy, uh, place an order, and then maybe the customer is going to get it in 24 hours, 48 hours, they're getting it delivered at home. But then you see new models coming up because uh, everyone is trying to figure out there are two challenges. One is convincing customers and getting them into a habit of ordering on online platforms. The other challenge, of course, is the last mile delivery to the customer. You know what I mean? There are a lot of V retailers get told about of how uh, we should invest in technology and allow customers to online and people who visit an Ocado warehouse in London, for example, they will come back and say, hey, you know, these guys are implementing such amazing stuff out there. But um, at the end of the day, the average ticket size, uh, if point me if I'm wrong, in Ocado is the average billing size is uh, 100 pounds. And Ocado, I think, still charges a delivery fee. In India, the average billing size for an online order is barely six pounds. And the uh, CPG manufacturer is sharing a 12 to 18 percent margin with the retailer. Um, and you have to work within that kind of a cost to do the last mile delivery. Uh, that, and then you have competitors in and around you who have got funded um, and a huge amount of money has been poured in to hook those customers with on free online, uh, free delivery at home. And uh, how do you manage all this? And often the challenge uh, for a retailer or a physical retailer is going back to the board and investors saying that, hey, you know, I have a reasonably profitable business out here running my stores. But I'm being told that I need to offer a lot more to the customer. And we are going to get into this home delivery business, which is not going to turn profitable in the next five, 10 years, but we are going to put all the resources into it. And maybe you're not going to see profits coming in anytime soon from the very profitable business as well. So these are interesting challenges many retailers face, but you see interesting models coming up as well. I mean, uh, from the first wave of e-commerce of home delivery within a, say, a 24 or a 48 hour guarantee, you see models like uh, Super, Milk Basket, Big, Big Basket Daily, which are doing these milk runs or consolidating orders across an entire gating commu gated community and delivering all of them together in the morning at 7, p 7 a.m., which kind of reduces to an extent the cost out there and still allows the customer to place an order daily. Uh, then you have a lot of interesting new models coming up. You know, I mean, the group buying phenomenon, which is see you see in the China, uh, live streaming, social commerce uh, trends. Uh, there are interesting platforms coming up like Misho or a Bulbul, which are experimenting with these. And how do you turn your customers into not just um, uh, your, uh, your uh, not just people who endorse or talk about or popularize your business, but also do the last mile delivery for you? Um, how do you do uh, encourage group buying where the entire housing uh, gated community buy places order and then it gets consolidated so that it becomes a little cheaper for the retailer to do a delivery together for a much larger ticket size. So I think over the next couple of years, uh, while obviously a lot of customers would opt for many of these services and would want things to reach their house homes, uh, we'll see a lot of new models emerging of how retailers crack that holy grail of doing last mile delivery and doing it profitably, even though uh, the billing size or the ticket size may not increase drastically over the next couple of years. I think DMART, uh, for example, Pradeep can touch upon, has, is working on some beautiful models, the DMART ready model, uh, where they're actually very close to cracking the whole cost um, 
uh, the, uh, the, the the whole cost conundrum with uh, doing uh, taking online orders and delivering it to customers' homes. Well, why don't we stay on DMART? Um, because I think, you know, looking at some of the, before we come to you, Rim, Rimmel, and, yes. and looking at some of the success factors, you know, DMART uh, is, is an interesting case study, isn't it? I think we can pull up a few images in a minute, um, Pradeep. Um, here we go. Uh, of 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 DMARC. but you, you, Pradeep, you know this. You know this model very well. Perhaps you could talk us through what exactly what DMART are doing. Yeah. So so DMART uh, uh, DMART has essentially two models. Uh, one model is a brick and mortar. Uh, one of the stores you can see on your screen. Uh, it's a it's a listed uh, uh, it, it's listed on the bourses uh, and uh, market capitalization is almost uh, two trillion Indian rupees. Uh, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that converts to about $2 billion, I think. Uh, this is a typical, uh, typical, you know, billing counter in DMART, and this is a weekday. Uh, the one that you can see on the screen. So this is one model which they have, which is the brick and mortar. The second one uh, that they have launched is an e-commerce uh, model. Uh, and this is uh, what we're looking at on screen now, the DMART Ready. Yes. Uh, so, so the e-commerce model is branded as DMART Ready. E-commerce also has uh, two variants in it. So one is uh, direct home deliveries, for which uh, DMART charges a nominal uh, delivery fee. And the second is uh, a pickup point, which is, uh, uh, you know, a typical dark store. So... Uh, so the basis, uh, after a lot of deliberation internally, actually, you know, uh, we realized that the last mile cost is a very big cost in e-commerce. It, it comprises almost 30 to 35 percent of the total cost. So how to get it down? So this this model uh, was coined, and uh, we uh, experimented it in a couple of suburbs. So the 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 fundamental is that you know the orders get consolidated for a locality and get delivered here. And the customers come and pick the orders in their allotted uh, time slot. And we do not charge a delivery uh, fee to them. And uh, this has become a breakthrough model uh, for DMART. And uh, as we speak, almost about 55% of the orders uh, now are serviced through DMART ready uh, pickup points. Pretty interesting, Scott. Yeah, no, it, it is, Dan. And uh, I've, I've, been privileged to visit both of these with uh, Pradeep, and uh, yeah, it's a very, very interesting model. Uh, I, I, I think the dark store pickup point model uh, has something working mm -hmm. for it in the UK. But you know, I'm, I'm really keen to get Rimmel's point of view because you know he he knows far more about this than I do. Thank you, Scott. Um, <clears throat> I guess look, the first comment for me would be. Um, Industry analysts often talk about fulfillment centers, and it's actually a, a very fancy term for potentially, you know, I, I could call my local store a fulfillment center. It's a physical box with lots of stock that is open to customers. Whether the customer chooses to come inside or we, you know, with Sainsbury's, Tesco, or somebody else picks something from that store and delivers it to the, the front door. So um, I think language can be a bit misleading sometimes. Fulfillment centers, you know, we've got thousands of them in the UK and they're, you know, they're called shops. Yeah. Um, and there's a big debate around, you know, to, to deliver something profitably to somebody's front door, that, you know, can you pick it productively? And then how, pro you know, what's the proximity from you picking it to the front door? And how much does it cost to do that? And obviously, we've got lots of different models for that in the UK. And, you know, they, they all have their pros and cons. Um, for me, I guess, in, in, back to the original question around, you know, what's changed over the last 12, 12 kind of months or so? I think a combination of COVID and technology have both come together to really drive competitive intensity. So if, if I think about, you know, my home market in the UK, where previously, you know, location was king in terms of where I went shopping. And I remember, you know, feeling quite puzzled for going to Thailand five, six years ago and seeing three 7-Eleven stores on the same street within 100 meters of each other, wondering how does that work? You know, how does a customer choose between them? And it often, you know, loyalty came down to the value add services that you could get in, in those stores. In the UK, I guess, you know, location is still key. If I'm thinking of where do I go to pick up a pint of milk, that's that's a key part of my decision. Whereas over the last 12 months, a combination of not being able to get out and, you know, technology players bringing the, sh the shop to me has suddenly meant there's a huge amount of choice of people who can get to my front door. 
versus the number of shops that are down the road. Um, and I guess the the benefit of technology is, you know, it opens up things much quicker. You don't need to, work, you know, find stores, build complex supply chains. Um, but I think, again, it's a, it's a good example of, you know, something that was already out in Asia, which we're beginning to see come to the UK. Ten years ago, would I have had 20 different companies able to get me a pint of milk within 10 minutes to my front door? Probably not. Whereas in Asia, they were there and they're store-based. So I think um, it's been really interesting to see the physical and the digital come together. Um, I think, again, in the Western markets, we see um, you know, things like data, all the analytics that go behind supply chains, all the technology, puts an Iron Man suit around the store. But it's also legacy, and you're having to retrofit to existing shops. Um, when, what you see in markets like Japan and China in particular is you know, some of these things are leapfrogging the, the, you know, the long journey we've had to go through in the UK. Um, and therefore, you see things that are a lot more agile. So if I think about the innovations during COVID in the West versus the East, there's, there's a lot more going on out, out in the East. Yeah, so so legacy can be a little bit of a disadvantage sometimes in, in terms of uh, being able to move, move quickly, right? A disadvantage in terms of having to you know, retrofit, but equally an advantage in, term, in terms of you've already got the shops, you know, they're, they're, they're already out, their location is still really, really important in retail. So if you can bring the two things together, suddenly you've got something for a customer which is actually appealing. If I, if I think back to the independent stores in India, for example, um, I can get, you know, the value add services, I can get credit. They know me on a one-to-one -one basis. I can get personalized range. As Dipayan said earlier, you know, each customer, without necessarily a big complex database, the independent shopkeeper knows the dietary taste, you know, religious preferences, all of that kind of stuff. And despite us having all the, you know, all the technology kit in the West, we, we, we're still not there. So I think harnessing, some, just not letting technology take the lead. I think often technology can become the excuse for not, not working around some of these problems. And the advantages don't always necessarily have to be with the big guys, in other words. You know, the, the agility and, and knowing your customer is everything. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's a couple of things I, I can probably support what Rimmel's just said there, Dan. Um, there's, a, there's a Karana shop local independent near where uh, I stay in Mumbai and the word no does not exist in their vocabulary. So I will go in and say, oh, I'd like such and such. And it's always yes. Some chappy disappears, comes back, gets it for you. So there is a history of this service that Rimmel's talked about. And, and obviously our modern trade friends, future group with Depay and Bmart. They have to do better than that. Technology has to do better that. Our Karana friends are also now starting to use um, technology as well. But um, Rimmel mentioned the uh, double wallers, the, the, the gentlemen who deliver the home food. Uh, Regini and I actually drove the train from um, Daravi down into Churchgate with them a couple of years ago. and. Uh, it's, it's absolutely fascinating, and uh, there is no technology, but it was the world's first home, hot, fresh delivery system. And, of course, it was in India, and it's still there, and we, we can learn from this because sometimes we make things far too complex. So sure, just to add, I mean, on, on, on that particular example, the fact is, it, you know, it works off public transport. There's no picking yeah. devices. Um, and yet the, the delivery window is one hour. So you've got to deliver 200,000 people's lunch within an hour. And, you know, with the very best will in the world, you know, if you think about Western markets, we're doing that kind of scale through the course of a day. So, and it, it, the system hasn't evolved that much in the last 10, 15 years in terms of the double wallers. So I, I'm, I'm really inspired by, you know, where that can go next. Dipayan, maybe you'd like to come I, I, in. I fully agree, um, I fully agree with uh, what Scott is mentioning and Rimal's own experiences out there. Uh, see, the thing is, the Kirana Wala in India, the neighborhood mom and pop shop, uh, has the best CRM in the world, right? She knows uh, the customer uh, even before she walks into the store. Uh, uh, he has the lowest cost structures ever possible. And as modern retailers for 20 years, um, uh, we have tried our best to not come anywhere close to his uh, uh, capabilities to service the customer with all the kind of services that they offer. The challenge really is that these models are often a lot more difficult to scale. These are not scalable models, right? 
the Kirana Wala works beautifully because there's this one man who sits there for 18 long hours, sitting in that store and managing his own show. And he's the, the owner. And he's the owner, right? He's the owner uh, and uh, he, his son probably uh, does part-time job over there. His family member coming in from the village gives a lending hand, delivering it to the customer's house out there. And um, he knows the customers intimately. But the challenge is these are not scalable models. And uh, this, the Kirana Wala son does not want to be, be a Kirana Wala anymore because he has 10 other career options today because of the kind of growth that is happening in the economy. Um, so the our hope is that one day technology will be able to capture this whole essence and allow this to be scalable. And that is all that we work towards is figuring out how do we translate the services uh, that a Kranavala provides and do it at a massive scale, deliver to customers uh, on time, provide them credit, know the customer better than anyone else, uh, anticipate her decisions, manage a perfect inventory, and run the shop in the at the best possible terms. And I think that's the dilemma, right? So we've got the, the rich proposition in markets like India. So as a customer, I feel you know really spoiled shopping even with an independent given the richness of services available. We've got the technology in the West, but it's not it's really difficult to personalize to a one to one. It can't you know it can be done, but it just it's it's difficult retrofitting that onto you know existing complex businesses. If you can put those two things together um suddenly you get that scaling that you've just you've just, you've just described yeah Correct. yeah just, just thinking i mean just a question from me really um and i i don't know i certainly don't know the answer to it but i've seen lots of interesting examples i mean how we we saw dmart i think we've seen other examples around the world that we you know that we all we all know well for stores that that try and optimize working both for customers who walk in and want to order online um, do you think do you think a model is 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 evolving there for 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 what you know best practice is? I mean because I mean just thinking about DMART, obviously they they I think it was they decided to with DMART ready they decided to start selling fresh milk at that location as well as picking up orders because presumably it went well when they tried it and uh, it starts to become a convenience store, doesn't it? I guess um, that very quickly you know. So what's the um, you know, what's the what's the what's the optimal model here? Do you think that can combine the two? And has anyone got there yet? Is is my is my question. I mean, the diplomatic answer for, from my perspective would be we're seeing all the models possible in the UK. And I think if you step out of grocery retail and you look at things like non-food retail and hot food, we're beginning to see you know, location. You know, a lot of innovation happening in location. So we're seeing the likes of Amazon coming into you know urban locations. You know picking from very small spaces close to where customers are and having to be really selective over what the 500,000 you know, best-selling ranges are going to be, trying to preempt demand. And then I think when you look at the um, the hot food delivered space also, again, the, the traditional notion of you need a restaurant premise to cook the meal, again, is beginning to disappear as you know more and more virtual kitchens are popping up. So I think there's a lot of creativity going on in terms of location. As we're seeing demand patterns change for customers so in terms of where do people spend their time but again as a retailer you've got to follow where that demand is and where those people live so the uk in, in many ways is easier because you know we've got a you know we're a small island with you know big density of populations and if you've got space it really helps launch all these services but i think what we're finding is some of these technology companies are beginning to find quite innovative uses um ways of kind of catching up so you don't necessarily need to have you know, hundreds of shops in a, in a town to offer a service. And I think that also opens up the door for smaller retailers and, you know, smaller independents. If you look at the proliferation of, you know, smaller food retailers on um, food platforms, or you start looking at, you know, um, the long tail of suppliers selling on um, marketplaces, suddenly it's bringing all these people together in the same place. So um, I think, you know, big waves, I think things are changing quite drastically. And in the UK, we're beginning to see that kind of bringing together of, when you can put location and technology together, what, what, what comes out of it? No, very, very makes a, a lot of sense. So, Scott, any 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 builds on that? You know, from your perspective, what you've seen that you, you think is is doing quite well? Yeah, I'm 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 going to just spin it round a little bit from something Rimmel said. I'm going to point this one at Depayan, if I may. Is is there a danger that we train customers? We are, we are customers as well, obviously, but we train us not to go to shops 
not to go to restaurants because some some of my friends in my local cafe are in real estate and you know they're saying that there 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 is a, a a nightmare coming down at the end of the year because we're going to have all this massive commercial real estate and either people don't want it or they don't want to pay their rents because hey we've trained everybody to sit at home and let it come i mean what what's your view for uh, for your market to pine i agree with this scott i mean and i wouldn't explain it from the point of view that to, in order to help my real estate friends that we need to open more stores but i'm really concerned about the we are future of the business looks in the sense uh, do i really want to limit my the sensorial experience of retail for my customer to just the visual side on a 6 and a half inch screen you know there is only so much that i can influence the customer with when i'm limiting her on that a visual space which is 6 and a half inch long uh, long uh, wide uh, the moment we do it we we'll limit our abilities to start influencing the customers of course i can know data about the customer i can ping her i can send her notifications and i can give her more discounts and stuff but if you have to really build new um, habits new categories uh, push new uh, ideas for the customer bring in changes in their lifestyle which uh, moves in a certain direction or to give them whole new ideas you got to bring in the customer into the store you got to give her the 360 degree look you got to excite all her senses together uh, there is nothing that recreates the magic um, of the theater than a physical store uh, so we got to be very careful while of course there will be a lot of online retailers uh, which will offer this convenience for the customer that hey you know I mean place the order and I'll get it to your home Uh, we should also be mindful of the fact that our future of the business lies in how we walk along with the customer and continuously explore new journeys and that can happen only within physical environments where you can excite the customer the titillate the customer and show her new options altogether but having said that i also agree with ramal i mean the physical retailers have a great advantage over e-commerce guys to deliver to the customer because we are the closest to the customer our stores are closest to the customer's homes rather than those warehouses of the e-commerce guys over the next couple of years we all of us need to think how do we optimize our stores to both cater to people who are walking into our stores as well as uh, how how do we optimize our stores to service online deliveries from those stores the pre pandemic we were all happy servicing 20 30 odd orders per day from that uh, physical store post pandemic we are servicing 200 300 orders five, maybe 500 orders a day from a small store or 1000 orders and for that uh, we need to rethink of how do we design the stores so that the pickers can do pick it up first fast without inconveniencing customers and also not delaying the whole pickup journey uh, for the customer who is going to get the source product delivered at the home uh, if you if you notice walmart has started paying the, their pickers uh, higher than their in-store employees uh, the, and the, their store associates Uh, because the pickers have a much more tougher job running across mm-hmm. the store picking up the stuff uh, and fulfilling the order to uh, have it delivered to the customer we need to think of how do we make it exciting for the customer as well as how do we redesign the store so that the whole picking journey also becomes very optimized so that the online deliveries also happen perfectly without uh, zero defects uh, to the end customer uh, so i think the next couple of years will be interesting in how we rethink the whole idea of the store the point just to Even build on what you've said i think there's a real um real estate dilemma so if you think about you know if i can get somebody into a physical store i have an opportunity you know there a bit of a captive market for a couple of minutes and i have an opportunity to sell them lots of different things and you know inspire them and create a good experience when you shrink that real estate from you know 5000 square foot down to 6 and a half inch screens suddenly it's um customer experience on steroids all the merchandising you do in a store you've got to be you've got to do that 100 times better because on a smaller screen actually you've got, you you get one opportunity to show me the right product the right suggestion the right services the right solutions whilst at the same time I'm being distracted by you know Facebook WhatsApp 100 one other things on, on the same device so retailing on a smaller screen i think is is much more challenging the, the expectation of experience go up and you know the speed at which i can copy something on you know a, a feature on an app is much much faster than the uh, building that out in a shop and scaling it to 500 locations. So I think there's a dilemma with as people you know as we try and rep- create recreate the best of 
physical experiences into screens, Absolutely. It, it, it's not easy. No, no, it's it's very tough. Um, just oh, thinking, of, just thinking about the sort of question of of of, of retail real estate, Scott. Um, perhaps this is something you could comment on. I mean, obviously, the background to I guess the, the background music uh, that we're seeing going on in the global industry at the moment is you think about the the Issa brothers buying um, Asda. Um, Think about the Kushtar trying to buy Carrefour. It didn't, didn't, uh, doesn't look like that's going to work out. But you know, some of these, there's some big shifts going on, aren't there? In terms of you know the, I guess, convenience estates and and uh, you know larger larger footprints and businesses coming together. Do you think that's part of the the background music, if you like, to a kind of you know some rethink, a big rethinking that's going on there? I do, I do, Dan, and I, I go along with both uh, Depine and Rimmel and some of the things Pradeep was saying earlier. I mean, if we look at it now, the, the, uh, everybody has a different number, but if we look at the UK, it's still 90% food and physical stores, 10% delivered. If we look at the real estate, we, we, we have to get our head around that or we, we're going to have a bit of a, a real estate train wreck because we, 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 we just can't not have our city centres doing stuff because of all the implications of that. Absolutely. But if you come back to it, why, why do I go to my coffee shop twice a day to get my coffee on hot chocolate rather than making it in my Nespresso machine? It's the experience. So I think, you know, we, we really need to think about this. We really need to engage people online. We need to make that efficient, but we need to make the shops more relevant, fun, because they should still be 80% of what we do. Makes 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 perfect sense. Look, guys, we're we're almost there, but perhaps I mean can't leave this uh, program without just asking about how things are in India in terms of you know the the, the our, I guess our, our global issues around uh, around uh, the, the pandemic. I mean, what's the latest in in India in terms of heading back to normal? We saw large crowds watching the cricket, um, and it looks like things are you know close to close to normal is that the case or was that just a you know the impression that that i got um Dipayan? No, things are uh, getting back to normal to a large extent uh, we i think the vaccination program has started and uh, I, I think there's a lot more people on the roads uh, you definitely can see and of course at the stadiums as well we love games where we were, uh, when we win them so we turn up in even larger numbers and in surat i think we will have an even larger crowd out there but um, I think in, in business-wise, things are getting back to normal. Uh, I think it's the lot depends on the, depends on who you ask to, uh, which kind of business you're asking to, which kind of retailer you're asking to, where they're located, what kind of customers they cater to, and what categories they play in. It's still a mixed bag, uh, but from a large macro point of view, I think um, the trajectory towards recovery continues to be strong. Uh, but the broad numbers suggest that probably it will take another couple of months to go back to where we were. Uh, at the pre-pandemic level. Yeah, yeah. Pradeep, anything to add on that? Yeah, I think I agree with uh, Dipayan. The, the, overall, uh, the overall texture, uh, uh, the, the sentiment of the people uh, look uh, positive now. And uh, uh, work has started, the volumes have grown, and this, uh, this new normal of, you know, a mix of working from office, working from home, uh, that has started. The employers also have settled down, uh, uh, and, and and yes, I think the economy is uh, looking upwards. Very good. Okay. Well, we wish you the the very best, and uh, obviously, we'd like to have been in Mumbai today, but thank you for getting us close to that, um, guys. Uh, Depayan, thank you very much. Pradeep, thank you, and uh, and Rimmel, thank you for for joining us from from London. Um, and uh, I know you're hugely interested in what's going on in. Uh, in the east, um, we appreciate you you adding your reflections and giving the sort of UK perspective on on that as well. So thank you, guys and Scott. Thanks for co-hosting me um, on, on this one um, and for you know for for the introductions um, that led to this episode. Uh, much much appreciated. Well, thanks very much, guys. And uh, if uh, we'll 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 see you soon. I'll uh, I'll just go and talk a little bit about uh, what's coming up next on Shop Talk. But uh, thank you very much for for taking part in this edition. Thank you so much. Pleasure being Thank here. You. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you. you, guys.
So um, that was interesting, wasn't it? Um, just, you know, a lot of different ideas uh, coming out of the East, uh, which is a, you know, a theme we keep coming back to, uh, both in Global Sea Store Focus and, for that matter, on Shop Talk Live. Our world tour continues. We can't travel too much, so we're continuing our journey uh, virtually. And uh, the next stop is uh, the Middle East. We'll get, we've written um, a big feature on the Middle East uh, in Global Sea Store Focus, as many of you will will have read recently and we're there with shop talk on the 4th of march um my co-host for that session is going to be nax global director mark waltman and uh we've got pet uh, we've got some great uh, uh, guests from petromin adnock and um and also we've got uh, the guest author who wrote the middle east feature um uh, nikolai joining us as well so that should be very interesting uh, it's a very exciting market uh, look forward to that on the 4th of march and um, with that, um, I'd just like to say thank you for joining us on this episode and uh, we'll, we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm.